Hello, this is Sarah Tuberty, your host from Disarming Disability. Enjoy the following program on Public House Media. Hello. Hey, man, what's going on? Hey, Jay, what's up, man? You ready to talk movies? I'm ready to talk movies. Let's do it. Welcome, welcome, one and all, to the creep show that we call Fear and There. I'm Jay, calling in from New York City. Oh, Jay! Every 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 time we start an episode, there's a beautiful introduction. That was that one was actually maybe the most beautiful. Uh, this is Zachary. I'm calling in from Columbus, Ohio. Hey, Zach, how you doing, man? I'm good. I'm good. I'm actually I'm actually looking at your face for the first time in a while. Uh, we're doing this. Yeah, over but Zoom. but the person listening, the person listening can't hear the face though. So, well, I could describe see the them. Face. I could I could describe you for them if you'd like. Uh, no, that's a waste of time. <laughs> um, <laughs> but yeah, we uh, I'm excited to excited to jump into this. This this episode is episode sixteen. Fifteen. That's right. Sixteen. Uh, sixteen. Yeah, and this is a very special episode. Uh coming off of a of a real high for us last week with uh with the brilliant robbie from straight chilling it's a great podcast check it out if you haven't yet um we have decided to have guests on that do not have their own podcast this week and (laughs) we're gonna bring back the friends and family episodes of uh of fear and there so uh i'm gonna uh we're gonna kick it over to our guests now which one of you guys wants to say hey first Hey guys, how you doing? I'm Colin from the uh, Seacoast area of New Hampshire. And uh, I'm Eric from the rustic beauty of Milford, New Hampshire. Oh, you guys, there's too much New Hampshire in this conversation. There's a lot of New Hampshire. For those keeping track at home, I I will say that for those keeping track at home, for those who are obsessed with fear and their mythology, Eric is now a a veteran, a seasoned vet of the podcast, uh, if you fall in love with Eric, if the sound of Eric's voice, as as we do every time he speaks, uh, be sure to listen to. I think uh, Hereditary was the episode that you were on uh, yes. uh, mm. last time, Eric. That's right. So, yep, yep. Make sure to check that out. Nice. Um, well, for those who are new to the show, um, and that is you, Colin. This is your first time on, um, and I don't know if you got a chance to listen to any episodes, but uh, this is the podcast where. Uh, Things are not a, as they seem always, <laughs> where we pretend it's a horror movie podcast, but really it's just an excuse for for um, for Zach and, and me to cultivate our bromance um, and continue to maintain our friendship. Uh, so <laughs> thank you, Eric and Colin, for, for being along for this journey. Uh, well, l- luckily, luckily for you, Jay, I'm, I'm also trying to do the same exact thing. I'm trying to, uh, to expand my bromance, and I know that you and I had a bromance once upon a time, so maybe we can find it as well. Oh, yeah, that's wonderful. It's very that's, that's beautiful. I think that's wow. a, a that's, so nice. that's a beautiful way to kick off kick off the episode. Um, so this episode we are discussing 2014's Creep. It is a found footage film um, by <laughs> a very strange duo of people, yeah. and by duo I I mean they are, it is just the two of them, with the exception of one disembodied voice. There is nobody else in this movie, so uh, yeah, and it's a bit of an older movie, and it also marks uh, I think another episode where Zach and I are actually rewatching a movie we already saw. Mm. So that's a little new. Normally we we keep these uh, we keep these these episodes for movies that we've seen but this was a nomination by our good friend colin here uh this is apparently a a i'm gonna call it a comfort watch for him uh i think he's seen it more than several times which is i (laughs) zach neither zach nor i can fathom how you would possibly choose to watch this movie so very many times (laughs) i I need to know i mean i i need to know how many times we're talking i mean can you ballpark colin how many times you've seen this movie 
Yeah, I mean, so I definitely saw it. I didn't see it when it first came out. Um, I have a, like, I, it always happens to me. I'll be like two years later, I'm like, how'd I miss this movie? Especially since, like, you know, uh, Duplass in it, I, I'm a big, like, League fan. Like, I, I like the uh-huh. guy. Like, I've always kind of, you know, been interested in what he does on, on the screen. So I had no idea this movie existed. I think I watched it three times in the first, like, month after I watched it the first time. Because I like to dig into movies. I like to find things that are going on in the background, find mm-hmm. things in the very corner, yeah. especially yeah. found footage movies. Um, there's all these little things going on in the background and, um, you know, I, you know, it basically ended up being, you know, like I said, three times in the first month. And then I think we probably watched it at least, <clears throat> excuse me, 10 times. Oh my, my wife's gosh. seen it three times. My wife's seen it three times. Um, I literally just like, we'll throw it on. It's like a background movie for us sometimes if we're just like hanging out on our iPads or something. <laughs> That's so ridiculous. It's a background movie for you if you're hanging out on your iPad. I know how that works. <laughs> yeah, you know? Yeah, just a, just a, just a crazy psychological thriller just to you know keep it it focused on something else right (laughs) oh my god yeah that's that we're gonna have to dig into that in just a second because uh (laughs) i don't know what that says about you psychologically but um here we are but um so this is a great segue into the first segment that we usually like to start these podcasts um podcast with and that and that's talking about the context with which you watched this horror film and horror is such a genre based on context it based on all the baggage you bring in uh for me i watch a demon movie it can be the least scary demon movie of all time and i will be scared of it because (laughs) that is a concept that just really gets me um and so i thought this week i would put a little spin on the context question and um we'll end with you colin because you just you just uh gave it a start but um I wanted to ask you guys about rewatchability of horror films, specifically about, um, especially now that our other guest, Eric, my brother, um, you had never seen this film before. And so first, tell me a little bit about uh, what, what you knew about it going into it, what, what you were excited for, um, you know, what was your context baseline. But then, you know, talk about, do you think that this movie is rewatchable for any sane person? Uh, so yeah, answer those two questions, please. I will say like right off the bat that this morning I got a very lengthy text message from Colin <laughs> that was literally like 40 notes on this movie. And, and I, and I like, I had to, I had to like look at this thing and then this person that was with me saw it from afar and they're like, Oh, what'd you do to your lady friend? You're getting reamed out. I'm like, no. Like, and then he realized I hadn't seen it, and I was like, I didn't read your notes because you're gonna just spoil the whole movie. Because, like, for the ones that I've never seen, I really like to like try and settle in and watch it the day that we do this. Mm-hmm. So it's like the impact. You remember? You remember when we watched Hereditary, and you know the the mom was up in the corner of the room, and I had no idea. And right, that's right. Oh, God, that's live. right. <laughs> but that was actually um, that was actually one of Fear and There's best moments, I dare say, in the anthology. Going back and having you having you look up that scene on air and and getting your reaction that was that was priceless. that's awesome. I was just yeah, like, was nope, nope. <laughs> that was awesome. Yeah, I you, listened to that you, episode. You missed it. <laughs> that was you, incredible. You, you missed it um, when you first watched it. You missed that scene, and I think uh, the fact that we were able to capture that reaction so perfectly was great. Oh my um, god! So I'll say this about okay, the, I'll so say you, this about the movie. The way going into it, I knew that it was about somebody who was you know mentally unstable um, to the point of you know like scary, violent, stalking kind of things. I knew that much mm-hmm. about it. And um, from a perspective of a guy where I live alone in a one bedroom apartment, very similar <laughs> to Aaron in this movie, and. I often, like, when I go to bed, you know, I've got my fan going or whatever, and I'll hear, like, little noises, and I'll always be, like, looking over my shoulder, like, expecting to see someone there, you know, like, <laughs> li- and so that hit really hard in this movie, when he was literally just, like, <laughs> like, laying in bed, and he would hear these noises, and he would just look around, and I'm like, oh, no, like, I didn't think that aspect of it was gonna hit me as hard as it did, but, yeah. um, I mean, that was... that's kind of, that's kind of re- reverse context. You brought in some baggage that I didn't think of. And now that I think about it, your apartment and Aaron's apartment oh my God. are, are strikingly similar in a lot of ways. And 
and you know, not least similar. of which is because they tow a line between shithole and livable. <laughs> you know, um, they're yes. like they're yes. small and there's they're not quite they're not super well decorated, but it, 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 it's not like you put in no effort. You know, a good, um, a good amount so. of a good amount of white wall, like a lot of white wall, a lot, a lot, yeah, a lot right, of white wall. Right. Well, I, I also you, noticed. Eric, I also <laughs> noticed that he sleeps. He sleeps with the bedroom door open. I do the same thing. I don't know what uh-huh. lunatic is going to keep themselves from being able to keep tabs on their whole apartment yeah. situation. Like, right. I want to know what's going on at all times. I don't give a shit. Plus, it gets you to the fridge easier at 2 a.m. when you're craving shredded cheese. But anyways, that's just... <laughs> <how it's- laughs> oh, that was um, me. That was literally last night for me. I really appreciate that. Absolutely. Oh, it happens all the time. Shredded? Yeah. Wait. Hold on, you had yes. shredded cheese, or did you have like a cheese stick? Because no, 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 no. Oh, we have cheese sticks, but I went for shredded. I couldn't sleep. And I was you're... hungry. Okay, yeah. and you're yep. wondering how, and so I'm the lunatic for, for not <laughs> eating shredded cheese, but I watch horror movies more than once. So stick your hand, stick your hand in there and just like handful oh. of shredded cheese, right? That's what, that's what we're talking oh, about. Guys, guys Zach, Zach is an animal. Zach is an okay. animal. We all know all right. it. Um, I, okay, so Eric, Eric real, real quick, real quick, after watching it for the first time, we're going to get into your thoughts and your review, but do, do you think this movie is actually rewatchable? Like, Think about the concept of you putting this on in two weeks' time. Do you think that this is worth a rewatch, this film? When I watched, um, Mark Duplass just kind of does it for me. He, he's mm-hmm. sort of like, yes. he's like a weird actor because he was in the morning show. <laughs> and yep. that's a great show, and I thought he was good in that. You know, and we obviously all like the league. But just, I don't know, I just feel like he's like fun to watch, and especially in a, in a role where he's kind of being his like laid back, kind of positive, fun looking self, but he's got these really creepy, you know, undertones. Yeah, that, definitely. That whole aspect, and, and having simply just two actors in the whole thing, um, it really kind of kept you on board for a bit, and I feel like it's one of those things where you would watch it again and you would probably still jump at certain parts, you know, that you weren't expecting. Yeah. Um, and, and I mean, like, we'll get into the details, but there was just some absurd things in it that I think if I watched again, I'd be like, eh, okay. <laughs> it's like, <laughs> I see. Yeah. So, so you guys are kind of watching it in, in, as an exercise in spending a little bit more time with Mark Duplass. <laughs> why not? I mean, why that, not? that was why I originally, that's what caught my initial attention right yeah. to it. I was yeah. like, are you kidding no. me? What? <laughs> I actually think that that is the only valid answer I will hear to rewatching this film. Um, so... <laughs> Awesome. So, Colin, I'm going to make my way back around to you. But, Zach, you and I, our context is very yeah. short. We have a bit of a, share, a shared context with this film. Right. We, it was one of our... Uh, when, when Zach, so a little background for you two on, and I guess for any new listeners on the call, Zach and I are, are very, very, uh, very dear friends who, who shared a common job right out of college. We both worked for a travel website as copywriters, as Zach likes to specify as junior copywriters, just so people know we didn't, you know, we hadn't quite earned our stripes yet. No, um, I only liked, I only like to specify that. Because one of us has progressed to senior copywriter and beyond, and the other one <laughs> didn't make it six months into that job. No, I'm the latter. The, the so. other, the uh, the other one has way more business on this podcast because you <laughs> have actually like been a, a college professor where you've analyzed film. So, um, <laughs> well, this is... anyone could have gotten that job. <laughs> Yeah, well, well, yeah, yeah. Modesty. You see, this is what I'm saying about the bromance, guys. Um, I can see so, it. <laughs> so, so, anyway, so Z- Zach hadn't been a huge horror fan outside of, you know, having seen f- classics like The Shining and Silence of the right. Lambs, I'm sure, um, right. these kinds of things. Uh, basically right. just going through the AFI's top 100 films just because he's he's just, just a for glutton yucks. for cinematography, you know? Just for uh, yucks. <laughs> so, 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 uh, just for yucks. Um, just for yucks. So, anyway, so I, I as, a, as a more fervent horror fan, um, sort of pushed him to watch more, more films. And Creep was one of the first, first films that we, you know, had our little date night together and watched uh, because it's sort of a vexing movie. You look at it and, you're, and, you, and you look at the concept and you look at who's in it and you looked at how simple it is. And you're like, well, that movie's going to suck. This is going to be the worst movie ever. And then you look at, like, the Rotten Tomatoes score or the Metacritic mm-hmm. score, and I think the Rotten Tomatoes is something like 89%. 89, or something yeah, ab- 89. Absurd. Audience 65 not bad. Is it really? Yeah. What is it, what yeah. is Metacritic? Audience for 65. This? I didn't look at Metacritic. Uh, the the Metacritic ro- is like 74. 
I'll I be think damned. Metacritic's like 74, which is also yeah. incredible for a horror film. Incredible. So, um, yeah. so, yeah, and so I think that's what turns on to it. And you and I both, you know, objectively loved this film the first time we watched it. We were both scared. We were both on our, yes. the edge of our seats. And oh, I think yes. that was in large part the concept of it, you know, the context that we brought into it was we didn't know what to expect. We, you know, this was early in your horror journey, Zach, I uh-huh, would say. Uh-huh. It um, was. And so, and so I think it kind of benefited with having such a blank slate of context for us. You know, right. there's so much suspense in this movie that loses all of its teeth when you know what's coming. So, um, yeah, Zach, is there anything you wanted to add before I jump over to Colin? No, no, no. You definitely, you, you cover the bases that I would have covered. Um, I, I, I mean, I'm, I'm interested in talking more about the idea of rewatchability in, horror, in the horror genre because so much of a successful, or at least what people imagine a successful horror movie to be involves surprise and, and shock yeah. value. And, yeah. and right. yeah, I mean, just by virtue of the fact that you might know what's coming, uh, you know, the impact of a film could be significantly lessened. I mean, I, we will talk for sure more about, uh, three of the four, four of us, am I doing my math right? Yeah. Three of the four of us have, have, have we're watching this for the second time or the 40th time. Um, and so we'll definitely get more into we'll definitely get more into what it was like watching this movie, I, knowing what was going to happen. Can I jump in just as like a guide situation? Like what I think we're seeing here is you know there's the discussion of a uh, rewatchability of a horror movie has to do with whether or not there's an organic sense of fear mm-hmm. or suspense coming. But mm-hmm. for people yeah. like Colin, right down yeah, there, yeah, I look he, at it a totally he, different way. Sometimes. Yeah, he just right. uh, he does this with a lot of horror movies. Many of them suck. I rewatch and, I rewatch a ton of horror movies. Yeah, I think I think there's a certain is there a certain favoritism kind of thing like a like you said comfort yeah. horror is that yeah is, no it, this is definitely a comfort it's a comfort watch in the same way that a chick flick is a comfort watch for some yeah, people exactly. you know I it's I, my I yeah so Colin I want to give you where I want to give you a tight two minutes to to <laughs> give us your case give us your elevator pitch <laughs> on why two. this yeah why this film should be rewatched with with vigor. And we'll with, shut the whole thing down if you go over two minutes. We're just going to shut okay, it down. Okay, yeah, no, just just shut me down. Oh, well, let yeah. me start. I'll Okay, time me. Start timing me. Um, honestly, right off the bat, found footage is, is my number two next to Slash X, slasher films, all that type of stuff. So anytime I see a found footage film, I'm always thinking that, okay, cool, you're getting drawn to like one um, like one thing on the screen. And that's the whole goal of like that every time, like you're supposed to be staring into the eyes of the person talking to you or, you know, st- like just staring off into the nothingness of a camera. But I like to rewatch movies because I miss stuff and I'll go back the second time and I'll be like, Oh my God, you see that in the top left? And my wife will be like, uh, what are you talking about? I'll be like, Nope, hold on. And I'll rewind it. And I'll be like, look, and she'll be like, I still don't see it. And I'll be like, hold on one more time. So <clears throat> I literally do kind of look back at movies, especially this one specifically, I would say from a rewatchability perspective, I really did find a lot of little things that I didn't notice that, you know, maybe even after the third time watching it, one of the big things for this movie that I realized probably after the fifth or sixth time, maybe even the 10th was there is definitely a good amount of improv improv in this movie. Um, I think the script behind it's, I I think the script behind it's great. But I'm telling you right now, like du- Duplass is absolutely doing a ton of improv. And I think, you know, I think actually both both actors do it a good amount. Um, and you can see that as you watch this movie more and more, you can literally see it like in their eyes as they're kind of going scene to scene. So mm-hmm. that like, you know, from a for a tight two two minutes, it really comes down to me of the type of movie that I'm watching. I always like to see if I can find little things that I missed. And, um, you know, at the end of the day, I actually like really just really like watching horror films and you know Mm -hmm. we've all sat there and rewatched saved by the bell we've all rewatched wonder years unless that's just me for those two shows but i like (laughs) to do that with or i like to do that with horror movies too um i'm actually rewatching full house right now uh, but i'm mixing that in with other horror movies and everything like that too that is a horror that is a horror show that's absolutely there's no reason why full house can't be horror (laughs) yeah nice um well this is great guys uh I think that that kind of puts the proverbial nail in the context coffin here. Um, so what we like to do now is just really quickly run around the horn, give a binary thumbs up or thumbs down, whether you would recommend this <laughs> film. I think I'm going to know all these answers. Uh, but um, before we start talking about spoiler and stuff. Um, so, yeah, Eric, thumbs up, thumbs down. Thumbs up. Definitely. Nice. Well, 
I, I, Zach? I absolutely recommend this movie uh, once. That's my feeling. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> no, and then, but, but, and then, but and then I mean, we'll talk more about this, but <laughs> I, I distinctly, so I, I, I keep, I keep track of the ratings that I give movies and I've done it for years. And I, the first time I watched this movie, Jay, with you, I, I rated it very highly. Um, and I'll, I'll be more specific at the end of the program uh, when we when we actually give ratings. But but as a first watch film with with no uh, prior information about it, prior knowledge of it, it's fantastic. It's a lot of fun. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's good. <laughs> uh, Colin, I'm assuming you're a thumbs up, but you know, for possibility, yeah, I'm a I'm a thumbs up, and I'll actually say like <laughs> I would probably say don't watch it more than once either, unless you're someone that sure. likes to really dive into a movie because yeah. I, I agree. Like you don't like this isn't something you just pop on. The normal person pops on more than a couple times. Maybe you watch it twice because right. uh, your friend hadn't seen it and you sit through it with him again. Um, but yeah, you do lose a lot of that scare tactic and everything like that. But um, you know, definitely watch it Jay? once without a doubt. Yeah. Cool. Jay. Um, Jay, well, you great. have not participated. Have would you? The. Uh, yeah, Jay. Uh, what? Yeah. What? Uh, God, I. I'm participating. More. You How can do it more. Be Hosts have to answer. Oh, can you give more. up a thumb or a uh, thumb down? <laughs> <laughs> it's just a thumb up or a thumb yeah, down. I, I, I think it's the same thing. I think it's. It, I thought it was a great film the first time I watched it. Um, yeah. And I think that has a whole lot to do mm-hmm. with the performance, the Duplass performance for sure. I think this guy has a lot of great sensibilities, even if if, if they are one dimensional in this film. Um, I, to, I, I think to me this film is kind of uh spoilers for for us if anybody has seen us but to me yeah. Mark Duplass in the league is the normal world and the below the ground kind of uh, effed up people with funny. deficiencies yeah. is Mark Duplass. Yeah, um, what's it called? The, oh, shit. Uh, so or whatever. so yeah, he's so similar to the upside not down it's, it's not called it's, uh, the upside down like it is in stranger things but that's basically what it is yeah it's it's well that's uh, what i what mean like it? when i said like with duplass and in the league versus this is you like duplass a lot because i feel like he sort of still plays the same guy it's the same it's the same character yeah, he's, with, he's like, like just, you know just same a exact tangent. character slightly charming looks Weird. like he might not have gotten enough sleep the night before but still you know yeah. like enough to you know keep your focus on yeah. it you don't really feel intimidated sure. by him absolutely yeah, it, it's it's like you twist the the manic dial two degrees to the left from his the league character and you get his creep character it's the same That's character one of the best parts about with that a, movie is because with a dis- yeah. disturbing twist yeah so uh cool so uh af- right after the spoiler wall i am going to so a little cliffhanger for you guys if you if you're somebody who like a like a crazy person is turning this podcast off <laughs> after yeah. the spoiler wall which is weird um there we will we will get into a shared experience that uh, Eric Kahn and I had Ooh. relating to horror. So stay tuned after the spoiler wall. So the spoiler wall <laughs> is going up slash down slash over right now. <laughs> and here we are, Zach. I want to try to keep this short, but I did since I we have Eric and Colin here. And last week we we reviewed or last month or last bi week, whatever, whenever <laughs> this is up. I think we're twice week tw- twice bi-week. monthly now. Yeah, every uh, yeah, yeah, two weeks ago. Yeah. Yeah. Uh our last episode we, we talked about Candyman, which uh which which is a film that deals with urban legend and stuff passed down by hearsay. And there's one specific moment that I would like to talk about in Merrimack, New Hampshire, um, oh my discussing God. Oh, a you're not doing this urban legend, and I would like which which whichever one of you guys can tell. Eric. I don't want to talk about where it landed at, where it landed, what happened. Eric. Whichever one of you guys can talk about the legend of Antelope Man in as short a <laughs> period of time as possible. Uh, please go for it while okay. I go and retrieve that. Would the beer. be. Uh, yeah, that would okay. be Eric without a doubt. He he was he was there for one of the for one of our friends. Like I, I'm going to preface Eric's talk real quick. Sorry, we have a friend and you know him, Mark J. Uh, Mark was absolutely scared, and I don't think I'd had ever seen him actually scared. He's the one who got me into horror crap and all this. Like he he's crazy. So this is this is legit. Oh, I'm so very excited for this story. Whatever this is, whatever whatever bullshit New England story this is, I'm very excited. <laughs> it is so bullshit urban New England, but it's awesome. <laughs> Get ready. <laughs> 
Um, so basically, I guess the story goes, we have um, these two friends named Brian and Mark, diehard horror fans. Like, they'd be super fun to bring on this. They might be too much to bring on this, to be honest with you. <laughs> but um, they they used to cruise around this one summer in a, like, old 80s Buick convertible thing. And, mm. and Brian was a sober guy, and Mark, not a sober guy. And so <laughs> Brian would always just, like, do the driving. They'd just go out, and that would be, like, how they enjoy this, how they get their thrill. So at this time, we were all working at a day camp together as counselors. That's kind of how we all met. And um, we're, we're in there one morning, we have the kids, and Mark comes in, and he's just, like, white as a ghost. And he pulls me and Colin to the side, and he's like, I have to tell you about something right now. Like, and we're like, oh, okay, tell us. He goes, no, I can't in front of the kids. And we're like, what? <laughs> so he brings us out. And yeah, he, dude. The, yeah, oh, yeah. The night before. This is like a been, Wednesday, too. This is like yeah, a Wednesday. Yeah, they've been cruising around, just, just <laughs> driving around Merrimack, New Hampshire, and they, boom, come across this road called Old Blood Road. Now, instantaneously, oh. that has an eerie feeling to it, Old Sounds Blood great. Road. So, of course. And like, it's a sketchy dirt road, too. Yeah. Oh, like, I love it. Yeah, they're like, of course. We got to drive down Old Blood Road. And he's like, fuck yeah, yeah we you do. have to. So, <laughs> so, so they drive name. down. They drive down and they get down deep into the woods in this dirt road. And all of a sudden at the end of this road, there's like like a house and like a big barn thing. And there's all these cars parked there. No lights on whatsoever. Nothing. And they, they look around. They don't see anything. They claim they might have seen somebody standing on a porch. But it was just like really you know, uneasy. So they're like, dude, we got to like turn around. So they pull a U-turn into this like parking dirt patch, I guess we'll call it. And they're turn around, they're driving back down this and you have to picture like your stereotypical trees and dirt road dirt everywhere. Road. Yeah. Like in the middle mm -hmm. of the night, like midnight and they're driving back and they look back and they see a set of headlights coming towards them. And they're just like, oh, that's weird. And he's like, dude, just play it cool. Just drive normally and drive normally. So he's like doing that and they keep looking back. And at one point he looks back and he describes it. And, and I'm not even saying it verbatim as somebody, maybe not a person, not sure, running on all fours, but not bending their knees at all. Just go straight across the path. And they're like, at that point, he's like, I, I tested it to see just how fast this Buick convertible could go. Because at that point, we were done and they came in and they were like i'm telling you man this is it was like an antelope man like literally yeah, if antelope i were to describe it, it was like an antelope man and from that point forward he started some weird merrimack urban legend dude the kids are still talking about it yeah the kids incredible. still talk about it yeah, yeah the kids still and, merrimack still talk about it all right, that's an incredible retelling, Eric. Uh, it's, I just thought it was so interesting because something like Candyman and the whole academic concept of urban legend, you, you don't know really when things start and they sort of get convoluted. Like, I've heard that story told 200 different ways from yeah it's and you can go up to most people that live in merrimack and you can and you'd be like hey you ever heard of antelope man they know. Be like, oh oh yeah yeah, yeah, it's kind oh, of yeah, fun yeah. That word. yeah most people below a certain age know for sure um yeah well i'm i'm glad we could have this six to seven minute digression uh, i'm running i'm running to get a drink i'm running to get a drink i'll be back in two seconds that's fine you guys that's, gotta that's get fine. the you guys gotta get your own little uh you know little uh yeah, ice for, box for here those, with all your drinks for those who would like to know our guest car our esteemed guest call in here brought a what i can only deem is a mixing bowl with ice and a bunch of correct sel like hard seltzers in it hard seltzers yeah. we're drinking vizzies yes. and trulies sorry if we're not supposed to do uh product placement but uh vizzies and new hard seltzer everybody's got to get on get on it antioxidants for days if we get sponsored by Vizzy and I have to like edit out truly, that's a small price to pay for that. <laughs> that's a small that price to pay. Hard seltzer money. Um, so uh, great. So we are in the discussion section of the podcast, and um, I have a few things I'd like to discuss. Not too, not too many. Um, I think we've covered a lot because I think we spent a lot more time before the spoiler wall this episode because this movie is it is spoilable, but I don't think. The plot of this film is secondary to the mood of this film and the pacing of the film, in my in my yeah, humble opinion. I'd agree. Um, and so I think, uh, and and the reason I asked you guys to tell the Antelope Man story was because um, Antelope Man is kind of like Peach Fuzz. You aren't really sure what he is. You aren't oh. really sure. You know, very animalistic. There's a lot of there's a lot of like sort of suburban woodsiness to that story. Um, so. What I, the first question that I'm going to pose, and I think I'm going to pose it to I'm going to pose this first question to Zach. Um, 
because he just got back from getting his beer, and uh, <laughs> you 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 two talked for a little while, and I I want to I want to make sure that for for the pretentious academics in our listener base, I want to make sure that we get enough uh, enough Zach in the mix. <laughs> um, so so Zach. Can you? T- I, I'd like to talk about the concept of pacing with you, because the pacing in this movie is vexing to me. I don't remember mm. my experience when we first watched it, but on second watch, I saw that timestamp and I saw that it was going to be an hour and seventeen minutes, which is like uh-huh. that. Crazy. That's an a- that's an animated movie. Like mm, yep. that's that's <laughs> short, so it should be fast. But this movie felt like it took two and a half hours when I watched it for the second mm. time because I knew all the stuff that was happening. Yeah. So I'm, I'm uh-huh. curious, what do you think, what do you think about this movie when it comes to pacing? Because w- when it comes to found footage films, pacing is kind of all you have, right? <coughs> so, yeah. So did you have any thoughts around the pacing of this film? I do. I do. I think that's a, it's a great uh, question. Um, to me, I think it actually, it comes down to a, the pivotal moment in the film. That's about three quarters of the way through when, um, uh, there's essentially a narrative about face and the movie goes from being a, uh, a kind of a, a film in the POV of Aaron um, played by Patrick Bryce, our director and co-writer uh, to when it's a POV on him, when essentially he trains his camera on himself and it's about his experience. So we're back in his apartment. Mm-hmm. It's his experience of getting right. the DVDs from, yeah. um, uh, what's his face? I can't think of his name right now. Joseph. Joseph. Thank you. Joseph. From Joseph. So uh, to me, that's the movie. The movie goes along at a pretty nice, consistent clip. To me, I think the pacing is it's spot on. I think it it moves pretty swiftly. You're right. You look at the runtime of this film, and and your eyebrows uh, raise because it's a it's a strange runtime. It's very very short. Um, yeah, seventy seven minutes is weird. <laughs> it's really weird. It's a super unusual runtime. It, it, it's 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 almost to the point where you're like, is this actually a short film? But it's, you know, it's definitely not. Um, <laughs> right. Uh, so to me, the pacing gets kind of uh, a wrench is thrown in. For better or for worse, is debatable. But there's a wrench thrown in the pacing, the, the pacing about uh, at about that three quarters of the way mark when there's a shift in the narrative. The focus becomes on Aaron uh, and right. the pacing and it kind of grinds to a halt in some respects. Um it's a it's a lot more passive. It's a lot more uh, strangely confessional. Um, you have a lot of fairly slow, in my opinion, monologues recounting dreams. Which, like, if you've ever had, and I'm sure all four of us have had this, if you've ever had somebody who you're not like sort of contractually obligated to listen to their dream explain a dream to you, yes, it's yeah. dreadful. It, it's pretty yeah. dreadful. Um, everybody yeah. has weird yeah, dreams. You're like n- none of this. M- None of this means anything. Yeah, it, it, no, it like, relates nothing to you. Like you're not yeah. related to it in any way, but you're just you're all. But like you said, you're kind of just sitting there because you you feel bad. <laughs> yeah, or well, you're wait, or you're waiting for your turn. You know, you're like, all right, well, your dream was cool, and I listen to mine, which is fascinating. But it's not. It's never fascinating. Uh, so I don't know. <laughs> I, I, yeah, that, I mean, that's my feeling about the pacing. I, I think it's a good question. Um, certainly because it really does. It kind of plods along. Not plod. It, it, it definitely. It goes along in a nice clip. It's consistent until that moment, and then everything really yeah. slows down and really changes. Well, yeah. So, so, so that's a great point, and that that's in line with my thought on it. What, what I to get a little bit more specific on it, I think, because mm-hmm. you're looking at kind of in the macro, Zach, which which I think sure. is is important because that is the turning point, narr- narrative wise, narratively. Is that a word? Narr- narratively, word. sure. Um, yeah. So. <clears throat> What I found frustrating, but what perhaps I I found compelling the first time I watched it, but the second time I watched it, what I found frustrating was the the pacing. A normal a normal horror movie is a, what I would consider a successful horror movie. You could kind of plot on an exponential graph of like stuff happening right you start slow start slow you get a little more you introduce introduce the fever pitch and then you reach this crest and then you resolve right this movie and some movies kind of go the opposite where they start with like a moment that's extreme and very viscerally upsetting and then they slowly kind of peter off like uh, zach a really good example of this is is uh jennifer kent's follow-up to the babadook uh nightingale oh yeah that that movie starts with just 
like just like one of the most disgustingly difficult things to watch. And then, yeah. And then, it, and then it kind of like slowly, you know, it starts with some really violent things and then slowly Peter's off and Peter's off. Um, and so I would even have given this movie credit if that was the case. What happened was they took that ex that original exponential curve and they copied and pasted in my opinion, the end of it into the into the beginning. So what they did was they had a little bit of a build up, but they very 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 quickly were introducing things. Like like there were so many jump scares in the first act of this film that I would normally hate, right? Because it's a fake jump scare or whatever. And it's literally like mm-hmm. a fake jump jump scare for the purpose of plot, right? Because Joseph's character is having fun and trying to scare right. to scare right. the the cameraman. Um and then when you get to the parts where it, it is Aaron in his apartment, mm-hmm. you, you kind of revert back to a pacing that yeah. I would normally associate with the beginning of a movie. And, yeah. and I, I think when I first watched it, I loved it because they had primed me so much to be ready to see Peach Fuzz leering his head or to see like even just Joseph like kind of being being zany popping up from behind the bed so all of those shots eric i think you were talking about um of aaron in his bed alone Mm -hmm. in his apartment they used negative space in those shots to such effect that you're looking and i think colin you also mentioned found footage movies you're kind of like your eyes are darting around the screen right trying to find that Mm -hmm. point of movement i spent all of those scenes this time looking to see is somebody in the background? Is the door going to slam? And they, they pay it off like once, I think in the last act of the movie, maybe once, um, when, when Joseph knocks the trash can over or whatever. Yes. Um, that's it. Yes. Yeah. So I think like, I mean, Colin, Colin, I, you, you're like, you're chomping at You want, you want to jump in here and I'm ready to pass it over to you. (laughs) No, no, no. That's, that's what I'll say is the first time I think this sort of odd structure of like, it's almost a bait and switch. You think the movie's going to be a certain way and then they, they kind of pull the rug out on you. I think that's very effective when you first watch the movie. I think it's not effective at all when you watch it the second time because I wasn't scared in the bedroom scenes because I knew the way that Aaron was going to die. I knew the end, that brutal axe swing at the end of the movie, Mm -hmm. I knew was how he was going to die. So nothing that happened before that had any sort of gravity, if that makes sense. Um, So, yeah, so, so Colin... You're, you're, you're I can, I can jump in on that. I can jump in on question. that point, actually. That, that last point you just made. Um, you knew when it was okay. going to happen, right? You knew he, how he was going to get hit with the axe, right? Do you know why you knew that? Because at the very beginning of the movie, literally, and I, I have timestamps because I was watching this again, and I was like, I got to get these timestamps. You see the lake that he dies at in the first 40 seconds, and you see the axe in the first two There's minutes. So, so there is so much foreshadowing, for sure. Mm-hmm. So you're right. But, but, you're right. If you're watching that movie, you should know right off the bat. It's like... <laughs> Okay. They they set you up for the whole yeah. plot of the movie I, right off the bat. Can I jump in and just talk about how yeah. one of the things I really liked about it and, and when you talk about foreshadowing is they like didn't mess with you with predictability. They were like, Yeah, nope. kind of pretty much what you think is gonna happen is gonna happen and they still managed to kind of get you yeah. on your toes. I thought that was interesting. All it's right, good call point. keep going because I want to tap on No, that. no, no, you're right. It's it's no, the that's... twists and turns. It's also very simplistic, the foreshadowing. Mm-hmm. Like, Zach, I, I don't know. You've probably received short stories from students or read, sh- <laughs> you know, things in the past that have had better foreshadowing than seeing an axe in, in the tree stump well, in the front yard. Yeah. Like, but, but I do want to say, I mean, this the film at least... Uh, tries to subvert the the notion of right, you know, check off his gun. You know, if if you see a gun in the first act, then yeah. by the third act, it has to go off. Um, it tries to subvert that, right? I mean, there's the scene. I think it's when they're on the hike that Aaron, that Joseph says to Aaron, you know, let me ask you. You saw that axe. I bet, I bet for a second you thought that I might try to kill you with it. You know, to call it calling attention to that is a sort of. <laughs> yeah. There's a kind yep. of postmodern yeah, exactly. commentary there. You know, I think the film is trying to be clever. Do you see that a, a lot in films, Zach? Do you see that a lot in films, actually? Because that is that that walking scene in the woods for me. I wrote it down too. like that sets for me, sets up the whole movie. It's like, OK, this yeah. is on. And do you see that a lot? I don't I don't really see like it's so forcefully just thrown in our face that it's like, all right, no, I'm telling you right now, I'm a maniac. Right. Well, no, <laughs> like, I, you, you don't see it in quite the same way. I think that's one. Uh, I think that's one of the 
uh, unique characteristics of a found footage film is that it's it's being a found footage film is something that's necessarily shot from somebody's point of view. And so, so you you have to like you take the idea of a found footage film with somebody holding a camcorder is that every time they focus on something, a detail, you're getting a sense of who they are as a person. And so like when yeah. like when Aaron trains his camera on something, we're getting a sense of what's going on in his head, or at least we're supposed to be. So when Aaron yep. with his camera arrives at this cabin or this house, this vacation rental, as we learn it, it's just a rental, uh, and he sees the axe and he zooms in on it, then we know what's going on in his head. We know that yep. he's having uh, this, this, yep. this, uh, you could, you could yep. call it a premonition, you know, or he's being nervous. He's, he's nervous about it. Mm-hmm. Um, so there was I, one more, I, yeah. there was one more point of foreshadow too that I had. I don't know if you guys saw it or not. And since we're being literal, like I was literal about the timestamps here. <clears throat> Did you guys notice mm-hmm. that he was out of breath when he walked up those stairs? Yes. Yeah. Yes. Yes. So that's not his house. Oh, yeah. If that's his it's house, not, if that's his house. house, if that's his house, he knows how he's not going to get tired walking up those stairs. But even he's, if that's uh, his house he goes to once a week. He's an incredible, even if it's once a week. He's an, that's but funny. he's an incredible con artist. He's an incredible con artist because he <laughs> recognizes right. that that might. I, I didn't wouldn't even think to call him out on that if I was That's running up the stairs, and Aaron probably wouldn't either. But he was like, I no. need to be three steps ahead of this guy, right. and and be like, oh yeah, you never get used to those stairs. Ha, yeah, ha, yeah. Ha. I was gonna like, say that. Wait, yeah. so so yep. Eric, I I feel like you've been you've been waiting in the wings for a little while, so I want to kick it over to you. I think uh Colin, you'll you'll have more opportunities for sure. Um, <laughs> you just put me on put me on but, mute on this one. I I'll come back later. <laughs> no, for for sure. I think you guys you I'm fascinated with your take Colin because you 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 have such a like a encyclopedic understanding. So, before I kick it over to Eric, I got a question queued up ready for Eric, but um I wanted to just put in your heads, guys, that we should definitely move to rename Chekhov's gun um, Joseph's Axe. I think that that, that is a, just a more biblical name. You know, it doesn't have all, all that kind of like all those ties to Russian literature and playwrights. It's just, ugh, you know. Like, yeah, you're, you're right, Jay. You're right, Jay. I think this, this, this tiny film. By Patrick yep. Price yep. should supplant yep. Anton Chekhov's notion. One hundred percent. You know. Yeah, I'm in. Yeah, yeah. Um, you know, everybody talks about the great. Everybody talks about the great American novel. When we were missing the great American film, the found footage. Right the great under American our, found under footage. Our nose. Yeah, yeah. Duplus. Um, That's all you need is a little Duplus. <laughs> okay, I mean, so who Eric. is Duplus if not the American Chekhov? I, I. Mm-hmm. That's it. that's just it. No. <laughs> so so Eric, I wanted to give you a freeform section a little bit because I, I just this is your first viewing, so I want to make sure you can pick out the things that you pulled out on the first watch. But um the other thing I wanted you to think about, and maybe this is what you would talk about, but um you mentioned Duplass in Morning Show, which which I thought I think he's incredible in that show. I think that show is very hard Amazing. to watch. But but um He's incredible in that show. I think he's new, his performance is nuanced and but also over the top when it needs to be. Um, so I think he's great in that show. I have such respect for him as an actor. After just like seeing him on the spectrum from the league to morning show is like that's that's like a really good spectrum. Even though this movie is him exploring the bizarro version of the league, um, but. <laughs> So, so Eric, I don't know if you want to talk about Duplass, if you want to talk about your viewing experience. Mm. I want to give you a few minutes to to sort of give us give us your thoughts <clears> on the first viewing. I'm going to put this out there first, so I don't end my spiel on a negative tone. But man, Patrick Bryce is a crappy actor. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, let's pin uh, this because I want to talk about this later for sure. Oh, let's pin all this. Right, all right, all right. Anyways, all right, pin um, it, Zach. Zach, you're gonna you're gonna run that part. Right after I think, this. Okay. Sure. That's a, that sounds like a that sounds like a new bromance that's gonna branch off here talking about how shitty he was in that movie. I, agree. <laughs> <laughs> I think one of the things that I noticed about it right away is it very much instantaneously had the very typical, you know, found footage POV thing where, oh, they're in a car and they're driving to somewhere you know, kind of off the beaten path a little bit, and they're talking about it, joking about it. At what point are you like have you not seen a million of these movies where you're in your car driving to a place for some unknown reason where you're like unsure about it are you not like man there's like a 50 50 shot i get axe murdered Mm -hmm. (coughs) they all start off that same way and as a photographer the other thing that got me is this guy's like i don't know i answer nad 
for a thousand bucks to shoot whatever discretion is you know important but you know i don't know and like instantly i was like this guy is just setting himself up for disaster Mm -hmm. yeah um i mean that from from a a profession standpoint, I was like, what, what is going on here? Like, why would he accept Oh, this interesting. Job? You're a photographer who probably sometimes has to meet strangers to shoot them. So you yes. brought in hmm. context you didn't even talk about. Yeah, this <laughs> this movie has a whole lot of, like, personal context because I definitely meet mm-hmm. people that I've never met before, very oftentimes alone in very secluded places. I don't know. Um, Wait, but, so, oh, okay, keep going, keep going. But so I think I was I was I was drawn to it only because like, uh, you know, like I think that it definitely pulls you in. You know, you want to know what's going to happen next. You want to know where they're going with this, you know, and then he and then um, Joseph's just all weird and just jumps on the car like instantaneously. And you're like, OK, so they're keeping you on your toes. And also <laughs> this guy's a nutcase. That's interesting. Right. So I um, I think what really grabbed me was the tubby time scene. Uh-huh. Which was just oh, so so damn weird. Like, it's like great. you watch it, and not only is it just like weird for the sense of like, man, this is really weird. But like, you start to see that Duplass is doing a whole lot of um, improvisation with what he's uh-huh. doing, and he really draws you into it because you know that Bryce was like, "All right, man, look, you got to pretend that you're dying of cancer and you are." cradling your invisible child that you'll never meet while you're naked in a tub with a guy you just met also you're not really dying of cancer and there is no child and (laughs) action you know and and i just watched that whole thing and i was drawn in instantly just because i was like okay so they gave him a lot of free reign on this and he kind of channeled a weird inner part of him that i bet not a lot of people who recognize him from other works really understand um about him and that was really intriguing to me because he sort of made like being a creep like like a happy go lucky kind of thing. You know, the whole time, no matter right. what, he's pretty positive um, until the scene. And then at the end of the tubby scene, he's just like he gets all deep and emotional, and then like puts himself under the water after making a suicide comment, and then he jumps out and scares and has fun again. And it's just so off putting. The whole mm-hmm. time you're like, huh, that's weird. Okay. Um, and then I think just from a perspective, I knew he was improving when Peach Fuzz came out and sang the Peach Fuzz song because you know for a fact there was no script to that song. Oh, that definitely no, not. Duplass just Absolutely. just w- winged the entire and that, thing. And it's, and that it's amazing. It feels like it was scripted. I know, the way, yeah, but it's that just was for sure. A couple times it feels scripted. But it's just so it's just so so much nonsense that right. that adds to the off putting and it like really gives you a view into like okay so this guy really is off his rocker with like the the mask and all that shit well, like but i i think like so what's really there are two things that are interesting about that one the improv i think this is what happens when you give a comedic actor and more specifically like a second city style comedic mm. actor um the, the reins on a, on a horror movie Good point. It, yeah, it's it's very specific, you know. I mean, we've yep. seen a lot of people do a lot of you know comedic actors go drama, go horror before, but this is like literally only him and the director. That's it. Right. And, and he right. wrote the movie with the director, so it's like yeah. it's not just his acting; it's his decisions, you know. So, um, I it's think also that an, that's exceptionally, well put. an exceptionally, exceptionally, um, uh, what's the word like? Ballsy. I don't know. There's a lot of gumption involved yeah. in being like, I can carry this entire film on my shoulders because of my because of the strange presence that I have on screen. I mean, that's it. Like, like, let, give me 77 right. minutes or whatever it is, whatever call and however you tracked it. Give me all of those minutes, yeah. 70. Give me 77 minutes to just be a character in front of a camera and I will give you a film. Yeah. I mean, that's impressive. And do you know what I liked about it is I feel like the direction that they had him go was so much more believable than a lot of found footage because it really felt mm. like they were just kind of dicking around on camera a whole bunch. You know, like even at the very mm. beginning when he's trying to explain this story about how he's dying of cancer, it felt like how you would talk to somebody like that. Like it didn't yes. feel acted, you know, it felt like a more direct I conversation. And, no, um, I mean, the first time you see this movie, or at least for me, the first time that I saw this movie, I was completely taken away by it strictly because he's a believable character. 
just like a hundred percent because of that reason. That's all it is. But but it's it's his motivation that I think is what's so believable. Because you guys were saying you keep saying like off his rocker, like kind of like an unhinged Not for person, me. which is it's the obvious read to me. He is so concerted with everything he's doing. Like if if we're gonna believe that Joseph, it's a plan. And, and, yeah. Co- Colin, you're 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 chomping at the bit, and I think this is a good you're a good place to kick over to end the 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 review segment here because, um, what what I loved about this is he. I mean, he's your classic serial killer that needs to play with his prey, right? This is this is what this person is. He does the tubby time is the very first thing to do because if this guy's not gullible enough to go along for this ride, he's not the guy he wants to kill right now. Mm. Like, right. he doesn't want to bring him on this journey because mm. what he wants in this journey is to bring this guy on emotional turmoil, rollercoaster.com. You know, that's what he wants. He wants this guy... To, to be tormented yeah. for weeks before he kills him, right? That, this is what he wants. And so right from the get-go, I think, Colin, that's what you were talking about with some of the foreshadowing with walking in the woods and stuff. Um, that stuff is... is he, he chose his words very carefully. If we're, if we're to believe that this character is real, he chose his words very carefully, and sure. this was a by design. And the only reason I say that is because the, the last shot of this film is him opening a metal cabinet and or whatever and seeing... Yeah, right, right. W- dozens yeah. and dozens of tapes, and, you know, this guy is a very intelligent, very successful serial killer. Not even though he's like yeah. a... Yeah, he's, a, he's even though he's a fucking idiot. So, um... Yeah, so Eric, I think that that's a good point. The tubby time was was like uh, the only monologue in the film. Um, no, no, so not funny. true. No, no, you there, can't, was, there was you, more. Monologue. No, you can't take no. away. And one of my favorite scenes in the whole thing is when they say, "Cut the camera off." I got to tell you a story that I'm really ashamed of. And uh, he right. tells the really yeah. messed up story yeah. with his wife. But and that, that was that's, scripted. That was a hundred percent. That was I, scripted. But it doesn't. It doesn't mean that it's not a monologue. No, that's right. No, no, yeah, no, 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 no. You're right, right. I should have I should have spoke more clearly. It is the only time where they were like fill two minutes with improv. Like yeah, yeah. him, yeah, him yeah, in yeah, the yeah. tub. They, they were like, sit in the tub and pretend you're giving a baby a bath. That was yep. the script. <laughs> you know? <laughs> yeah. Well it, well, it was interesting. For the first half of the movie, I was trying to keep a hug count because he just seemed like he wanted to hug a whole lot. Yeah. <laughs> There's a lot yeah. of hugs at the beginning of that movie. <laughs> There's a I think so I got to hugs. about seven or something like that. <laughs> um, I mean, honestly, really? wait, I, I, wait, did you count? You said you counted how many hugs in like that first couple minutes, you said? Yeah, it was like seven up. Yeah, the last time they hugged, I think, was the uh, scene where they were like in the 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 pond, you know, in the the, the yeah. fountain thing. But at the I got I got to admit, I got to admit, it, it really made That's me. That's not like, true. That's not true. That was not the last hug. The where last do they hug, hug is when he's they when he's on the balcony, he doesn't know where he is, and then he's like in a trance behind him, and then he starts bawling his eyes out, and he goes in for a hug to cry. Oh, oh okay, you're right. That's right. Yep. Bottom line is. This movie, if it did anything for me besides give me real unsettling factors, is that maybe Mark Duplass is a really good hugger. He kind of looks like he'd be fun to hug. Like, he's wearing and, he's wearing a lot of he's wearing a lot of athleisure, which is very <laughs> right. That's right. He's very he's like a Ned, he, yeah. he's Ned Flanders. Ned Flanders on the skiing trip. <laughs> Ned Flanders in his on a skiing trip is the best thing. <laughs> Seems like he's wearing nothing at all. <laughs> nothing at all. Nothing at all. <laughs> I can't believe you brought up that reference. Um, what, what, I, what I what I equate with the hugging and all that stuff, and and this feeling I have of man, I'd hug Mark Duplass. Is that they were they were still drawing you in to like try and trust. The character uh-huh. of Joseph, like you wanted to believe that he was a good dude and that he was just really looking for a friend, even up until the very last scene before he gets axed in the dome. Like you <laughs> really wanted to believe that this guy just didn't yeah. have any friends because he was weird. And like anybody who's been in a situation where they're a little bit off the beaten path in terms of mentality, and you're like, man, yeah. I just they just really want to have you know a friend who understands them. But no, then and he it's puts just on weird. then he puts on peach way, fuzz right? and then. <laughs> axes him in the dome and you know you're just like man maybe i don't want to be friends with the weird you dude don't, what's great about it is you don't want to believe that he's a good guy like you know right. 
to right. your oh, core, yeah, he's yeah. not a good guy. Yeah, you yeah. know it. Um, yeah, but but, it, but, but like, maybe to your core, you only know that he's not a good guy because you know it's a horror movie. Sure, that's not a bad. Oh that's not a bad God. point. That is, I, I, I just so meta. I just want to say that I'm really outside of the people, movie. So. People are people are socially awkward. People like actually like perceive scenarios differently. So like some of those conversations yeah. they have, maybe that is just somebody that might be a little more socially, you know, uh, I don't even know what to say at that point. Like not even like socially all there, whatever it may be like, yeah, there's yeah, a little so, bit like something maybe, here and maybe there, on the, on the yeah. spectrum or something. Not even that, yeah. not even that just socially awkward maybe. And it's like, you don't even know how they, yeah. they don't know how to interact person personally with people. And that's kind of like to yeah. Eric's point, I was thinking that the entire time he was saying it, that's Wait, no, I Zach, originally Zach, thought what, it could be. Yeah, Zach, what were you going to say? Oh, nothing, nothing smart. I was just going to say that I'm disappointed <laughs> that our podcast isn't called Axe to the Dome. <laughs> <laughs> that is very, that is very smart. What do you mean that's not smart? Uh, Colin, I, w- I wanted to, I wanted to give you the floor to close it out before I, I kicked it over to the ending segment. Um, I had some questions for you, but you were chomping at the bit a little bit to talk for various moments in that Eric will tell you that I'm the worst. So we're doing zoom right now. And I'm also the worst. Like I just all, when I get excited about something, I just like, I got to talk. That's how it is. Sorry. I'm you're like cho- the worst you're chopping at the bit. They might say <laughs> he will, he will, it, he will interrupt you in person, no matter what. It's just harder on zoom because there's a delay. So his interruption <laughs> comes after you've already put your foot down and said, absolutely not. And then he still interrupts you anyways. <laughs> <laughs> well, but it's like the problem is we're on we're on a Zoom call and we're also on Bluetooth headphones, I'm sure. And so everybody's delayed by a full second and then call yeah. Colin apparently has this this habit of interacting with people that way. So Yes, I do. I, I this is why I wanted to give you the floor though, Colin, because I want you to pick one of those things that you texted my brother ahead of time <laughs> and, and, wow. and, and, ta- and talk about it. I'm not going to give you a tight two, but, you know, try not to go no, off I'll the keep rails. It, I'll keep it, I'll and, keep and it nice you, and... Yeah, I want some analysis from you. That's what I want. So, I, like Eric said, I did, uh, I, I think I watched the movie probably for the 40th time, like, like Zach said earlier. Um, and I wrote down my favorite scene in the entire movie is the tubby scene. So I'm not going to talk about that um, because Eric just did a great job talking about that. Um, when he puts the peach fuzz mask on and he stands in front of that door, like, mm. at, like literally at that, I was waiting for something like that. Right. Was everybody else like, when is this going to yes. actually, which, when is wait, he, wait, 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 which, when which he, time? when, when, <clears throat> not not when he's in the closet doing the dance and the song. That's 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 still to got me. It. That's still a moment of okay. This guy's just a little crazy and he's got cancer or he's he's about to die and he's just trying to make a fun video for his kid. Mm-hmm. Obviously, we don't think that or the viewers aren't really thinking that from a horror perspective. But when he when he ends up like going down the stairs and and Duplis is standing there in the mask. He's got his hands out, his legs out, and he starts thrusting. Uh-huh. It's like uh-huh. this, this, this is what I was waiting for. I was waiting for the turning moment <laughs> of this movie to be like, like for Aaron to be like, I was right. I needed to get out of here about a day ago. Right. Like, like I should have never even came. <laughs> and, and it's like, he does the air guitar when he, when he, like you see the difference into of peach fuzz, right? So peach fuzz is a super fun character. When he first shows him, he's, he's singing, he's doing air guitar. Like I love when he does air guitar. It's like one of the coolest things. I think peach <laughs> fuzz like is like a Nick awesome. Feeny move. Like a Nick Feeny move. Oh my move God. Is it is so there. Nick <laughs> Feeny. It's like power rock. Right. And, and it's, and it's like, you want to love that villain because it's like, that's fun. Like, and that's how I kind of look villain sometime it's like all right i like this film because he's you know he's doing cool stuff but then you see him in this in this totally different setting of now it's time to play like you know i told you that i'm a wolf i've already right. told you that like i've already Murder told in you my heart. everything i've told you everything you need to know at this point and now it's time to show you and that at that point for me it was like all right I was I knew it was coming so at some point it's going to happen but this was the moment that I was waiting for in the movie to take that turning point and to to your guys's points too 77 minutes that felt like it took an hour and a half just to get to that point so it's mm-hmm. like yeah. you know you, you you feel that about the movie and the mm-hmm. way it paces out and I I just that that part of the movie for me was yeah. you know and even then he's still doing the age old Joseph Joseph are you okay it's like bro yeah. get out 
find a window and jump through it. This dude's got a wolf mask on that he bought at dollar store like eight weeks ago. Like, get going. Mm-hmm. Seriously. Um, okay. Right. Well, I think I think we've covered. Yeah, we have that's... covered. You guys, you guys have done a wonderful job. Um, this roller coaster of a conversation. So at this point in the podcast, we like to go around the horn and, and, and rate rate the film on two scales. The first scale being the scariness scale, which is we we like to do on a scale of zero to five sheep, as in how many sheep you have to count to fall asleep. Um, so zero being least scary, five being most scary. So uh, I know we've all seen this. You know, either this was our first time, our second time, or our 202nd time. Um, Zach, why don't you go first? How scary do you think this film is? Sure. Um, I actually am, yeah, there's something a little bit frightening about this film for me, um, which I feel like we actually haven't done on this show. We have not done a horror film that has scared me in a, in a long time. Um, mm. But this is definitely closer to being scary than than many films that we've done in recent history. So to me, this gets this gets a two and a half. I I mean, Duplass is and we've talked about it until it's dead. So I won't I won't rehash it. But his his performance, Duplass's performance, is very frightening. Um, and I mean, for me, the you know the quote unquote dollar store mask, the peach fuzz mask, is frightening. Like that's a good that's an effective prop. It's an effective prop. Yeah. I think it's a really it's a well designed prop, and I think it's used well. So, and that and that scares me. That definitely scares me. I, I didn't, it's a good prop. I, yeah, I didn't. I didn't lock the doors. I didn't check to see if the doors were locked afterward. But then again, my partner Mandy did, so <laughs> that was good enough for me. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so, did you give us a number? No, I didn't. Two and a half. Thank you. Thank you, host. No, you did. You did. You said two and a half earlier. Oh, I did say oh, two and a half. Yeah, I'm pretty good. So, <laughs> yeah, re- retract that thank you and replace it with a fuck. Thanks for nothing. Um, <laughs> thanks for nothing. <laughs> yeah, so I, just so you know, you guys can use half ratings, which is particularly particularly fun when we're talking about sheep because there's, you know, in, to visualize in the implied the gore sheep. there. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Um, Eric, why don't you go? Three and a half. Only because it's going to be really unsettling for me going to bed tonight alone in the same scenario, and yep. then I'm going, to be, yep. I'm going to I'm going to hear something. And it's probably just going to be my fridge picking on. No, but no, no, it's no, going to be Mark Duplass. No, no. no. yeah, Mark, be, Mark no, Duplass is going to no, he's going to roll yeah. in there. I'm going to wake up to a stuffed wolf sitting like on my chair or something like that, and it's just go. yeah. And God help anyone mm-hmm. if they ever leave a DVD at my door. I'm just saying. Oh, my God. Oh, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> How would you even play it? You don't even have a DVD player. I'd put it in my PS4 because I'm an adult. <laughs> <laughs> I have a PS4, yeah, but it sounds like um, it's going to explode. Three and a half for personal impact, for sure. All right, good. Got it. Good, good, Got good. it. Yeah, in, in your shithole apartment. Uh, hey, 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 hey. It's got uh, AC. <laughs> Colin, you're up. You're up. Tell us, tell us your scary scale rating. Yeah, I mean, like everyone knows that I'm pretty, I'm pretty into this movie. Um, I never give anything five. Like, it, it, there's no perfect movie, so um, definitely a four. Um, I think when it comes down to it, like Eric just said, if you ever feel like you're in that type of scenario, this movie will will absolutely come back into your head. Yep. And I just think it's cool. I think it's a really cool yeah. premise. Um, so, yeah, nice. Um, so. I think for me the scary the scariness level of this film is I when I first watched it it was about a 4 and when I watched it this last time it was about a 2 so I'm going to split the difference 3 3 sheep 3 sheep scary nice. um and then I'll shift over to our quality rating which is uh just a 0 to 5 out of out of uh 0 out of 5 stars uh for how good you thought the movie was 5 being a masterpiece 0 being I believe Zach, how Zach put it a pile of trash um and uh, again, I'm going to have to split the difference. When I first saw this, it was a four. And when I saw it this time, it was a two, you know. And so I'm going to I'm going to have to give it a three. I think it's got value. I think for the first watch, it's it's it is very, very it's a very lauded movie for for a lot of great reasons. Um, mm-hmm. And I think it deserves a four if you've never seen it. But I think I saw a lot more of the holes in the film this time. And so it brings it down to a three for me. Um, let's go back around the other way. Uh, Colin, you go first on the quality. 
Uh, I'll stay. I'll stay with a. I'll stay with a four just because of the same, kind of the same thing you just said. It, it, from a rewatchability perspective, for me, it has a lot because I'm just. I really like this movie. Um, the actors, the premise, everything like that. But for somebody to watch it more than once, you're probably right. Like a, an everyday person that just likes horror films, not going to watch it more than once. And there's a lot of great movies out there that I would write like a four and a half or even close to a five that you can just crush a couple times. So I'll stick with the four on this one. Cool, Eric. I would probably give it a four if I wasn't so kind of like micro focused on Patrick Bryce's terrible acting. Um, and I know everyone's oh gonna be God. like, well, he directed it though. But like, I don't know. Maybe it could have been better. I mean, like he was basically just playing like a pawn in the entire fear game that this game, you know, and, and I think that maybe to save some bucks, he was like, you know, this is just a, a response to the call. You know, and I'm just gonna jump in and do it. And you That's know, it's actually, fine. I never thought, Eric. I never thought of that. Yeah, he, he's not. He doesn't play a character that has any depth whatsoever. He's he's just part of the mental game. Um, but you know, I, I would give it a four if I wasn't so hyper focused on that. So you know, we'll call it a th- three. Mm, okay. Okay. Yeah, you, this call it, you can't is judge it. I, I talk. All right, he can. Get a, he can I get a few. It. I get a few classic PBRs up in me. I thought you were going to give it at least a three and a half after saying you couldn't give it a. Four. If I give it a three and a half, will you <laughs> shut up? <laughs> <laughs> no, we don't change. Hey, we don't change ratings here. Okay, your vote has been counted. Three. All right. It has been. It has been fed through the scantron, and oh, yeah. that's your score. So, uh, Zach. Uh, what is your rating? And then I guess also comment on, on that, the bad acting point that my brother made. Yeah. I mean, I'm really glad that we brought that Eric brought that up again. Um, I, that, that plays a big, uh, role in my rating in my, I don't know. And yeah, in my rating of this film, um, not so much the acting as it were, I, I'm not, I'm not totally, I wasn't totally distracted by the by the by the poor acting, and to be sure, it's definitely poor acting. But it didn't. But a poor acting in a horror movie is nothing new. So I, I, I take that, I, I can take that in stride. For me, it's the total lack of character, which is also something that Eric just brought up. It's he. Yeah. There's no there's no personality, uh, and Eric just said. I mean, I couldn't I couldn't say any say it any better than Eric just did. I mean, essentially, uh, Patrick Bryce's character Aaron, our, our avatar is just a, a symptom of the mental game that Mark Duplass's character, that Joseph is playing. So, uh, like, I, and, that, and that extends to motivation. Uh, at the end of the film, I, this idea that Aaron would accept the invitation to go to the pond is bullshit. It's just bullshit. I'm sorry. It's just complete bullshit. This guy is so creepy. He is so aggressively creepy. There's no way that he would say yes. This, like, pa- yeah. this, like appeal to yeah. pathos. That, you know, he gets this DVD from Joseph and Joseph's like, I really need a friend. Bullshit. Not a fucking chance. Not a chance in the world. And I and obviously this is the sort of subjective. This is a subjective thing that pretty much every horror movie comes down to a question of motivation. And you and this is why it, classically, like in a heart, when you go to see a horror movie in a theater, people are literally screaming at the theater like, don't do it because people act stupidly. They act inhumanly. And this movie to me is just another example in a long and proud tradition of of non realistic people doing non realistic things, uh, or unrealistic. I mean, um, anyway, um, yeah. I, I and I don't I, I don't necessarily think it's a function of the acting so much as a function of just like they didn't bother to try to develop this this character, uh, and it would have and it really would have made a difference if if he had been something if he had been a person. Anyway, um, the first time I saw this movie, I was a four stars for me four pentagrams. <laughs> Um, I thought it was so effective. Mm-hmm. The second time this, uh, when I watched it yesterday, uh, it, it felt like a two and a half star movie to me. Uh, I, it's, it's a very one note. I love Duplass's performance. I think it's brilliant and just so fucking insane, but acting against a, a character who doesn't seem even remotely real just didn't work for me. Um, you know, there were a few good scares, but they were mostly just jump scares, which are like, Fun, but also yeah. you don't get points. You don't get points. You just don't get points. Right. So, Espe- as, no. Especially when, when they throw the pacing of the film off. You know. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Like. I, yeah. Yeah. Exactly. I mean, I was really happy to rewatch it. 
And like I said, like we said at the beginning of the film, you know, we all would recommend this film without reservation, I, including me. So I, I absolutely would. I just wouldn't see it again. I would let it. I would let it like be bronzed in your memory as a great movie experience yeah. that you never revisit. Yeah, like like Han Solo and in, in like Han Solo, Han Solo and Carbonite. That is creep. Yeah. Creep is yeah. Han Solo yeah. and Carbonite. So you, so Zach, you're a two, an official two and a half on this. Two and a half for me. Yeah. Yeah, beautiful. But okay. but but it's a it's a two and a half with a little like heart next to it. <laughs> <laughs> two and a half with an honorable mention. Uh, nice, nice. You're you're a son of a bitch. You know that. Um, <laughs> Thank you. I am who I am. So so this uh, this brings us right to the end here. Um, Thank you so much, listener, for listening. Thank you so much, guests, for guestening, and uh, <laughs> and. And we really appreciate you guys being on. Um, before we go, just a reminder to uh, check us out at fearandthere.com. That's A-N-D, not ampersand. And, uh, and you know, if you disliked everything that we said, or if you would like to get Colin's phone number, uh, reach out to Fear <laughs> and There. <laughs> reach, out, reach out to Fear and There at gmail.com and follow us on Twitter and Instagram with the same name. Uh, we want to thank Public House Media again for uh, for having us on board, and uh, thank everyone for listening. Um, and I think that's it, guys. Thanks a lot, Eric, Colin. Thanks so much for coming. We will have you back once we get enough episodes. Absolutely. You know, this was a blast, guys. <laughs> yeah, thank thank you guys for having me. I appreciate. It. I, I love talking this stuff. This is this is awesome. So this is the appreciate. Shit, yeah. It. Thank you. All right, guys. Well, thanks for listening. Thus concludes episode 16. We'll check in with you all later.